Please take a seat. Gentlemen, you're standing and our virtual audience is waiting for you to take a seat. Gentlemen, sorry to interrupt you. Would you like to take a seat? Thank you so much. Business cards exchanging hands. A network moment happening right now. Fantastic. Plenary five. I do not want you going home at 8 p.m. Fantastic. All right. So I am so impressed that you are here for the last plenary of a conference that has had four plenary sessions, 15 technical sessions, and all of the networking bilateral meetings that you've actually been through for TT 2023. We are talking plenary five about climate finance, public and private sectors mobilizing climate finance to help create resilient transport strategies and resilient transport. I am curious, as you are here at 4 p.m., what do you need to know? Victor, please ask our online audience. Victor is head of chat, asking the online audience, what do they need to know? And three volunteers who I will select, if you don't volunteer yourself, to stand behind the microphone, because I want to know what you need to know from this session. OK, microphone is right there. Who's going to go to the microphone? Excellent volunteer. Two more. Fantastic. One more. One more volunteer that I will select from the audience. Thank you so much for volunteering in the green uh, sweater. Looking around at somebody else wearing a green. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Wonderful. All right, so we have enough. What do you need to know from our expert panel? about climate finance, just very briefly. I'm Michael Replogel with the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Um, I'd like to know uh, how effectively and quickly uh, development banks and climate finance institutions will deliver uh, effective channels by which uh, smaller NGOs and uh, capacity building organizations can tap funds to support capacity building at the local level to build a pipeline of sustainable transport investments and initiatives, particularly ones that involve aggregating lots of small investments in things like micromobility and bike lane development and traffic calming. Thank you, Michael. That's a lot. Wow. <laughs> Well, it's a, but it's it's a concept for a structure that's Ooh. been talked about for years, yeah. and I'm impatient to have it delivered. All right, Michael, thank you. Take a seat again. Appreciate that. Hello, sir. What do you need to know from our climate finance experts today? Thank you so much. I'd like to uh, learn on uh, the rural access, the concept of rural access in climate finance. I am yeah. Gungu Kojandamu. I work for uh, Bridges to Prosperity. We work to provide access in the rural areas. Wherever there are impassable rivers, we do construct bridges to allow for kids to go to school and market and people go to health centers. So I want to understand the consideration in the rural context. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I wanted to make sure if you are spending your time with us at this point in the afternoon that it is worthwhile for you. All right, we already have an agenda. Hello, wonderful climate experts, climate finance experts. I am going to start right next to me with Mahua. Mahua, would you tell our audience who you are, what you do, so they can see where you fit in to the picture this afternoon? Sure, thank you for me and thank you so much of course, to World Bank and WRI for having me here. Uh, until a few weeks ago, I was with the government of India and I was managing a, um, an electric mobility company. When I got off, we had completed tendering for 17,000 electric buses. Uh, the country has a target of 50,000 electric buses and we completed a little short of half that. Um, just to put this all in perspective, the 50,000 electric buses is about 10 billion US dollars. The last tender was three and a half billion uh, US dollars. So it's very appropriate that we have this conversation on finance and I'm looking forward to listening to all of you. How are you feeling? Tired. <laughs> <laughs> Franny, hello. 
Hello, Femi. So good to have you. Will you introduce yourself to our virtual audience and also our audience right here in DC, please? Yes, thank you, Femi. So I'm Franny Leotier. I'm the senior partner at Southbridge Group and the CEO of Southbridge Investments. And this is a Pan-African investment bank uh, when I'm based in Kigali. Good it's to a have great you. pleasure to be here. Oh, it's our pleasure to have you. Emmanuel, so nice to have you. Please say hello. Everybody's microphone is on. I would not punk you like that. You don't have to fiddle with it. I promise you, it works. But I like the way that you're being very, very, very detail orientated, just to check it. Sure. All right, Emmanuel, go ahead. So thank you, Femi. Uh, very good to be here. Um, Emmanuel Nyrinkindi, I'm with the International Finance Corporation. I'm the vice president for what we call the cross-cutting solutions area, which uh, very simply is those areas that uh, cut across uh, the organization. It's our advice to governments who want to bring infrastructure through public-private partnerships, uh, advising them. It's our work uh, on gender and economic uh, inclusion, the work that we do on our environmental and social and governance uh, uh, aspects. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Hello, Patrick. My name is Patrick Steinemann. I work at Bank of America in a mobility group, and that, what that group does is we're in the corporate and investment bank helping corporates to raise capital. Uh, that is both equity and debt capital uh, globally, and uh, all of these companies which have to do with mobility electrification, mobility services, uh, software and hardware and the likes. And these are the companies that we uh, bring to other investors and help them to grow and raise capital. Sinja, so good to have you. Please say hello again to our audience. If they were here this morning, you would already have seen our VP from the World Resources Institute. Um, but please introduce yourself again. Thank you so much, Femi. Yes, I'm uh, Vice President at the World Resources Institute. And of course, we work on accelerating towards green and inclusive mobility, as the title of uh, the conference says today. Uh, in my, my previous life, I was member of the Dutch government responsible for decarbonizing transport, public transport and active mobility. Um, and so I, uh, uh, I worked a lot with members of the World Bank uh, to ensure that we create the right also circumstances for all of those finance flows that need to flow to the different modalities of transport to be focusing on the right solutions. Uh, anyway, so very happy to be here and uh, indeed congratulations to, this, uh, to these people who found these two days so interesting that they can't get enough. So let's see if we can, uh, we can maintain that spirit. I would like to do a speed round first of all. Climate financing connected to resilient transport. How is it doing right now? No filter, totally candid, just so I can see where your mindset is and how far we have to go. Franny. Um, I'll focus on Africa. Africa receives only 3% of climate finance, uh, and that is already very limited. And so if you take from that then the transport sector and the transition that the transport sector has to do, uh, it is very little. So I think the big jump for Africa is to get more of climate finance and to channel more of that into infrastructure and particularly transport. Mm. Stinger, what are you writing down? I was trying to get a very brief answer and trying to write that down saying it's not enough, uh -huh. it's not the right kind, and it doesn't go to the right transport sector or actually to the right people. So that would be my answer, but oh. now I don't have to write it down anymore. It's perfect, yeah. I intercepted your brain. Yes, that was great. Patrick, go ahead, be candid. Yeah, let, let me use um, the, the ESG uh, terminology uh, to make an example and out of the whole uh, pond of investors, uh, there are uh, bond investors. And within that, there is ESG. Uh, in, in terms of the total pond, we have about 5% of all bond funds invest in ESG related uh, uh, companies. And that is a 5% number, is a very low but fast growing uh, uh, from a low level. Now, the emerging markets within that are yet again 5% approximately and and that's really the magnitude that we're talking about here is from a very small base albeit with a with a high growth rate forward Emmanuel so I'd like to build a little bit on what uh, Sinjay said and uh, also um, uh, what uh, Franny said uh, what we have is uh, a big number, but it's not enough, and it's not going uh, necessarily to, to, to the parts where we need to go. Context. We need about 3.7 trillion on an annual basis up to 2025, right? Governments are putting in lots of money, 
it's not enough for what we need to do. If you look at the challenge, particularly for emerging markets, you need about uh, two thirds of uh, that funding to be going to emerging markets. So uh, collectively, what we're doing, public and private, is not sufficient. The question for us is what we can do to, to elevate uh, that, not just in Africa, yeah. but across the globe. Emmanuel, that's spooky because that's what this entire session is about. What can we do? Do you have some answers? A couple of them, right? So um, uh, uh, w w there's a tourism in our industry that you assign responsibilities to the party that's uh, best able to bear them. So one thought, public sector, we the bank group, right? We work with governments, not just to uh, provide the funding that they need, right? But to help them build the capacity, capacity not just to implement their programs, but also to open up spaces where the private sector can come. To also address uh, issues like uh, de-risking those spaces and providing resources. For example, I was just having a chat with Mahua before, about uh, blended uh, financing, right? Uh, uh, funding that actually makes uh, projects work when you're trying to either de-risk or to support a market that, whose time has not come, right? So these are things that government can influence from the policy side, but also from the funding side. Mm. On the private side, most of us are trying not just to uh, listen to those signals to look out for them, but look out for them in the right places. So the point Franny was saying about Africa is true broadly for emerging markets. We also need to be bring innovative, uh, I would say, product solutions and partner more effectively with each other. <laughs> Uh, particularly for the most uh, difficult of markets. So lots of solutions, but requiring creativity, requiring partnership, a uh, partnership across the two sides of a spectrum. Well, we'll pick up on this idea of risk mitigation. So my fellow panelists have said that we don't, uh, the climate finance that we need is not, is, is a lot more than what we have. But in my mind, climate finance is exactly risk mitigation. We need a lot more of climate finance to do the things that it's not doing. We want it to be creative. In my mind, Emmanuel is saying cre creative. Creative is the, is the willingness to think a little bit differently and to take a certain level of risk. Now, if we have climate finance asking exactly the same kind of questions as commercial debt or any other sort of commercial money, then, I mean, really, you know, there has to be some, something different about it. Where I, from where I sit, um, where, from where I live these days, people think of climate finance as cheap money or free money. But free money is limited, of course, but they mostly think about it as cheap money. In my mind, it's interesting money. You know, can I, what can I do with it to correct a certain market failure? Because that's, that's the whole idea. So it has to fix for risk. And non-verbal somehow always um, uh, comes across, uh, even if it's unintended. So I didn't want to preempt the rest of the panel. But it's so true that when we, we think about the public funds available, there's always going to be just such a small part of what we actually need. And so then the question is, what can that public money do specifically that nobody else can do? And it should focus really on that role, trying to leverage all of the other functions that other parts of finance can have. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually also partly an answer to, to the question that Michael raised. What kind of an approach do we actually need to build between different partners in the financing chain that will enable us to go from with a limited amount of public funding to attract larger amounts of funding that can take more risk, that can connect to larger amounts of funding that can take no risk, and then so and then bringing that back from the very large scale again, bringing that back to in a way in, in, in like an hourglass to a pipeline that would also allow small scale projects to access those larger amounts of funding. WRI is developing some of these approaches, uh, not so much in transport at this moment yet, um, but as Franny knows very well. Um, in the context of uh, urban water resilience, for example. We're trying to build that connection, that, pipe, that, that connection between financial partners, including capacity building, including project preparation, including de-risking, including some form of public grants, to then enable a pipeline, which on the other hand also generates, let's say, smaller projects, but aggregated to a size where it's also interesting for larger uh, financial flows to actually f flow to. So you get speed and scale, 
because your point was also speed and getting to those smaller partners. For both of those things, I think, you need to build a pipeline of partners before you get a pipeline of projects. Thanks. Fanny, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to pick up on what uh, Cindy just uh, ended saying and maybe give three examples from Africa. I know I said only 3% of finance from climate finance goes to Africa, but there's a lot of innovation. So the first innovation, which illustrates uh, the examples that uh, Cindy was mentioning, uh, you take the African Development Bank. They have uh, funded a bridge in Abidjan called the Ufwet Poignet Bridge. It's a toll bridge. And as soon as the bridge was fi fully financed, all ESG issues taken care of, they transferred the transaction to the private sector. So portfolio transfers from MDBs to the private sector could speed up the and reuse MDB capital quite efficiently and crowd in private capital to support infrastructure uh, investments, particularly in the transport sector. Uh, second example is uh, Uganda, and this comes to Michael's question on how do you get to the really small, micro, and, and other uh, stakeholders in, in the ecosystem. This is a, an electric mobility solution uh, motorcycles in Kampala that use rechargeable batteries. You run your motorcycle, your battery dies down, you go, you replace it with a fully charged battery, and therefore you get a very quick solution with e-mobility. Why does it work? Because somebody came forward and provided pre-seed funding to a very small company. Individual owners of those motorcycles can pay as they go, so you have mobile payments, and then you have now a scale-up with private equity coming into that sector. You wouldn't imagine that private equity would be interested in investing in such a solution. Third example uh, is, is a much larger scale uh, solution where you have huge opportunities for road safety. And here I put on my other hat as a board member of WRI uh, to mention uh, one example which I found really amazing. Uh, when we uh, were selected as jurors to pick innovative solutions from cities, mm. the very first winning city a solution was from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. I remember. Of a state road safety. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And this was funded by philanthropy to start with. And then once it was up and running and it was demonstrated that you can uh, uh, save the lives of children who are crossing these very busy streets with very simple solutions in infrastructure, then you can crowd in uh, government and private resources to scale it up. It's now been scaled in multiple cities across Africa. So these are three quick examples that show you how you can leverage MDB funding uh, how you can crowd in private investment and how you can uh, use innovation with early financing from philanthropy to then scale up using other sources. Patrick, I want us to be really aware of the cost of what it takes to mobilize climate finance. How much will it cost us? Well, the, it's obvious, obviously, that uh, there's a lot of funds needed. Yeah, a lot of funds needed not only in the normal transportation uh, evolution, but now we're talking about a transition on top of the, the uh, normal growth. And that transition into, for example, electrification is a massive one that uh, you know, on a global scale uh, uh, companies have to, countries have to struggle with, but uh, individual um, uh, nations have to uh, then make an individual uh, local case about it. I would say, you know, just taking the example of electrification maybe to the point um, uh, for an electric vehicle, be that a bus or a scooter or a four-wheeler, uh, you need a charging system to begin with. Without that, it's of no use. And the charging system actually is, uh, is grounded in the infrastructure uh, financing that you need to get in place first. Uh, that infrastructure financing isn't ju just a charger. It's about the stability of the framework of the utilities, uh, the pricing of the, uh, the electricity, uh, then the urban development, where those uh, charging stations should be, and if urban development moves, that, that needs to move with it, with the population density and where those people sleep, work, and, and, and eat, and so forth. There's so many things connected that you almost can't uh, you know, see the pile of money that's uh, that, that, that's needed from the the magnitude of it. But uh, starting at the framework of it, having a stability of framework, looking at the right pattern, and learning from the the uh, early experiences of of nations uh, that have gone through this, making decisions where to invest in that infrastructure at the initial point, 
that's where investors would basically follow the trace and say, okay, we've got a case here, this works. And then it can grow from there on and follow the whole S curve until everybody's driving electric and that will be a long, long time. But it's that initial uh, infrastructure that needs to be there. What do you think of the transportation projects that have a high decarbonization um, element to them that will be most attractive to the private sector? Where do you think the private sector will go, ah, this is good for us, this will work for us? What do you think, Patrick? You know, I'd, I'd continue with the word infrastructure because yeah. investors do like long-term uh, stability and infrastructure does provide that. So charging is actually an area where private investors like to put money. Mm -hmm. um, the, the issue with, uh, with, with charging is that it's relatively asset intense. So another area where investors also like to go, which is a bit more asset light, is mobility services. You know, pooling platforms or sharing platforms, the likes of uh, ride hailing and so on, which are just technology solutions that also need financing. They are a bit easier to uh, enter into by investors, uh, are a bit more risky perhaps, but uh, established business models there can flourish. And that would be uh, s two examples of attractive areas for investors to, to go into charging, infrastructure and um, mobility service platforms. It was framed, we, it could be perceived as though um, the answer would say that climate resilience investments are more expensive than other transport investments. And I actually think that there is an interesting discussion there to be had. Because yes, of course, investing in transportation asks for a lot of investments. And the, let's say, the division of costs over infrastructure and the actual use of that infrastructure is different with green technologies than it is with fossil fuel technologies. But I'm sure that Mahua from, from the procurement in India will give the example that actually uh, uh, an electric bus is cheaper than a diesel bus uh, if, you in, if you include the life uh, cycle of it. Um, and actually the case that we had in the Netherlands is that the charging infrastructure, there's a business case. So we pre-financed some of the rollout, but the actual business case is there. But what you have to do as a government, and that's where politics and policy play a great role, is to create that certainty of outroll. So if you create the conditions, you can also create the conditions for the market to take its role. Uh, and it's still a lot of a big volume, but it's not more expensive. Uh, that's just something I wanted to, uh, to highlight. Thanks. Mm. I, just, I just want to add one more thing here. Um, you know, let me draw some parallels to maybe in the renewable energy industry across the, the more developed markets that have, um, that have financed contracts on a power purchase basis. In the early days of wind and in the early days of solar, people were putting money into companies on a corporate finance basis. And perhaps Patrick can, you know, I'd love to hear what, the, what he's finding as you're raising money for companies. There's only so much you can do. You can load up the corporate entity till it becomes a shaky, shaky thing. And, but that's not the way to build a market, right? So with a little bit of experience, that market has to go to the next level of sophistication to be able to raise money on a project finance basis. In the transport world, it's, I suppose, asset finance, not to get too technical with our audience. But if I have a load of buses or if I have a whole lot of electric three-wheelers or even two-wheelers, but if the objective is to deploy at scale, then really I should be able to raise money for that against that service contract or against that usage. Mm -hmm. Until and until we're able to make markets a little bit more sophisticated like that, we'll be struggling with questions around, you know, whether I'll get paid back or the credit worthiness of the counterpart and, you know, the, some of the same old questions. And I think the renewable energy industry gave us something to think about because a power purchase agreement is a completely bankable instrument. So you had a question for Patrick. Patrick's going to answer that question. Emmanuel is going to tell us what he's been writing down. And then Fanny's going to tell us what's on her mind. Patrick, you start. Yeah, from uh, the perspective of electric buses, uh, clearly there's a lot of uh, involvement uh, the state can have. But it starts with uh, you know, regulatory, it starts with um, the infrastructure, and then also the public uh, and transport support. Um, you know, the, more, the more you go over to individual mobility, um, and, and maybe there to go to the extreme of two-wheelers, uh, it, it's more a matter of um, 
providing the impetus for, for consumer demand and supporting the rollout of, of that switch to electric, and which again comes back to charging. In, in all of this, I think it, there isn't one size fits all. You know, project finance could be for a very large um, yeah, city-wide infrastructure for supporting the charging of buses at the terminals. Um, uh, which would need to be individually developed finance. But it could be more standard in, 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 the ter in terms of um, you know, supporting a certain corporation's uh, bus purchase program and, and uh, leaving it to the development of the private market then to go on from there. Manuel, can you share some of your thoughts? Yeah, so um, I think you said right when you're asking the question of uh, what are investors are going to be uh, looking for. Mm. And so for me, it's still that same traditional, whichever uh, piece of a spectrum you're looking at, the traditional transport or the more green transport, right? It's still the, um, listen, it's about risk and reward, right? And you have to uh, kind of make it worthwhile. So if we think about the more traditional forms of uh, transportation, right? The, the, the standard ones, that we know, not, not the greening ones, right? Whether it's in road or ports or rail, right? As we continue to do scale, I think the old, um, um, challenges we found of uh, reduce uh, political risk, right? Um, uh, this is the big issue, right? Where the market opportunities, so, so the traditional businesses. As we think about these uh, new uh, technologies, new opportunities, right? The point about um, uh, how do you bring uh, more investment into emerging markets? Some great examples that Franny shared, right? Mm -hmm. um, as we think about um, uh, opportunities like uh, um, electric buses, back, uh, um, Park transportation services that are greener, right? An example, uh, recently in the uh, in Senegal, was something that uh, we structured together with the bank that um, uh, has the opportunity to, to provide uh, good services for about 300,000 people. You need to think innovative, right? So what can the public bring in terms of affordable financing that then the private sector is able to bring additional financing, uh, we take away this uh, piece of political risk, and then it becomes affordable, right? So I think the elements of uh, transition risk, uh, uh, technology risk, right? Uh, these are the things that we need to think uh, very innovatively about. How are we going to structure for that? So institutions like MEGA that take away political risk, um, partial risk guarantees, all these uh, traditional instruments, we need to think how we deploy them across the, um, the, 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 the um, introduction of new technologies into new markets. Uh, a point that has been made consistently about uh, scaling, right? We need to think those even more carefully as we think uh, how we're going to scale up. Are we still tinkering around the edges then with climate finance? We're not really scaling up so that there's major change that is able to happen, not just around the edges, not just experimenting. I think increasingly we are having uh, more impact, right? So the pace is accelerating. The question is whether we're accelerating is sufficient to the challenge, right? So the number I threw out, right? <laughs> um, uh, 3.7 trillion per annum is a huge number, mm. right? But I see across the DFI community, the, the whole element of uh, partnering to not just uh, use our own balance sheets, but for all of us to, to, to work across the space, working with the private sector to, 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 to then leverage uh, kind of what we bring and what uh, the private sector brings in terms of financing. On this table, there's been a discussion on how can you bring also philo uh, philanthropy into that space, right? How can we bring um, uh, additional instruments, right? This is a question for all of us, right? So, so, so I think we are scared up, not just uh, uh, product innovation uh, funds that are kind of being deployed. In one group uh, last year, we did 35% of our financing was a significant amount of money, right? That is something billion. But the, the question is whether we are growing as quickly our impact as the, as the challenge continues to grow. Rising populations, rising mm -hmm. infrastructure needs, uh, needing to uh, transition those uh, technologies. Let's talk about innovative financing. Franny, can you lead that conversation? Are you seeing it? We, we are seeing it, and uh, I think there are exciting examples of how that's going to scale. So I'll give three examples. Mm -hmm. The first one is um, uh, using digital, the digital economy to get the solution that Mahua was suggesting that has worked in renewable energy. 
How do you do that? You aggregate micro assets, because you can do it now with digital technologies, and you make them available then as an asset class for investors to come in. So if I can take 100,000 motorcycles with uh, tra chargeable batteries, that becomes an interesting investment size, and I can securitize that asset, and I can bring in guarantees and insurance, and then it starts to become quite interesting to investors. Second example, this has to do with the multilateral development system and the way budgets are classified in the public sector. It's been very hard to get uh, financing for maintenance of infrastructure. And that's why countries borrow to build new infrastructure, then they let, let it collapse, and then borrow to build new infrastructure again. And this has been a fight with the IMF on the classification of maintenance uh, in something called an R ratio, where they have ratios of what the public sector should spend in uh, new capital investments versus maintenance. Fanny, Just can I so ask you, sorry, is, is it psychological? that it's much more exciting to build something new than to repair something that's been there for ages. I mean, that's boring, right? It, it used to be because yeah. politicians like to cut ribbons, but yeah. now with climate, <laughs> risk, with climate risk, it's actually sexier to do maintenance. I was Why? trying to avoid the word sexy because I felt it was a little shallow, but no, I love I, that you I, used I, it. I, I have to use it because <laughs> it gets people's attention, right? So it's, it's sexier to do maintenance nowadays because of the climate risks. Yes. Two quick examples. Yeah. Flooding. We just saw the worst flooding in Pakistan. Mm. If you look at what was the first thing to go, it was transport infrastructure, right? So if you, and Bangladesh has been living through this for years. So how do you go then with a flood risk that is increasing across the world because of climate risk to bring a sexy solution in maintenance? Mm. That storm drainage, right? It doesn't look very sexy, but if you do it right, then politicians will come cut ribbons that they've done now in a number of cities because drains have been uh, created. And then you do it to create pedestrian ways so that bicycles and people who are walking can walk along, right? So you get climate solutions with mobility solutions in one go. That is happening now uh, in some cities. It's quite exciting and it can be done more of, but it's a budgeting issue, the ratio between maintenance and capital expenditures. Last example. And this one I find really very exciting, comes to what Emmanuel uh, was talking about earlier and what Patrick said as well. We are all looking for carbon sequestration and carbon credits. Transport is one of the best sectors to generate those credits because you save a lot of emissions by switching from fossil fuels to non-fossil uh, driven transport, whether it's battery operated, electric uh, solutions, or others that uh, hopefully with the hydrogen revolution we can also uh, bring into, into bear. And that, those companies that are now looking for carbon credits or countries that have that as part of their zero carbon strategies can look at the transport sector as a great source for carbon credits. And I think this is an area where private investment can flow, philanthropy can flow, and, and government to government exchanges as well. Oh, Ma ha, and then Stinger. Uh, let me add, I, I just want to add one more example to Franny's list. To get scale, the model of making something service is suddenly opens up a different set of conversations, a different, different set of investors. For one, it makes the whole business a little asset light and therefore more accessible for public. And when you do that, you can reduce the cost. And what that means is you don't have to work, work on the fares. You don't, you don't touch the fares, and fares of public mobility are subsidized around the world, and they have to be uh, for us to do more and more. So if we can think a little bit more around selling a service. And whether you're selling mobility or selling technology or selling ticketing or selling whatever it is, if we can move that into a service, suddenly the ability to scale from 100,000 100, electric bikes just becomes so much easier to get to uh, a piece of investment that private investors would like to look at. It's very difficult to sell 100 bikes or even 5,000 uh, bikes. It's very, very difficult. The level of effort go that goes into a 5,000 bike deal is exactly the same as something that goes into a 300,000 deal. There's so many interesting things being said, so I have written down a few. Um, so we're all thinking about how do we close this gap, right? And so 
we need more, is what we discussed. We need more innovative, and I think, from your point on maintenance, it's absolutely spot on, as is your point, Mahil, on service. But I think we can also lower the bill. If we want everybody to have their own electric vehicle, it's going to be massively more expensive than when we start rethinking what our transport bill should actually look like. And if we think that about 40% of, of all traffic um, in, in urban areas, and that's where the boom is going to be, is less than five kilometers, let's say around two miles, two, two three miles, then active mobility could actually take away part of the bill, right? We could lower the overall amount that we actually need by looking more at different sources of transport. And if investing in active mobility is a lot cheaper, than investing in new highways. So we can also lower the overall volume that we actually need. Um, and it's better for equity as well. And it's better for the environment as well. So let's also see what we can do to lower the bill. But financing those cheap solutions is actually much more difficult than financing a toll road, right? So how can we make sure that those active mobility options actually be, just become as financeable as the next toll road? because it does lower the overall bill. And then the final point is, who pays? Why should it always be, let's say, the government that pays for the infrastructure? You can also, for example, if you want to stimulate active mobility, increase parking levies, right? Those people that then absolutely want to go to that center of the town, let them pay for it. It works very well in Amsterdam, I can tell you. Everybody rides their bike. Uh, you pay about $8 an hour if you want to park there. Uh, it does bring down the number of cars that actually park in Amsterdam all day, and it generates revenue. It generates the revenue that can then be used to create those safe spaces, those biking lanes, those parking, or those walking uh, sidewalks that many more people can benefit from. The ratio of one bike versus, or the ratio of one car to bikes is one to 26. You can accommodate 26 people on a bike versus one car in the middle of a multi-million city that makes a big difference. So let's also see how we can jointly lower the bill. This brings me to where does the money come from? Cindy, you started. Um, get on your bike, get out of your car, some money there. Patrick, where does the money come from to fill this climate financing gap to help resilient transportation? Yeah, it has to come from all different pockets. <laughs> that <Yeah>. is clear. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> because the amount required uh, exceed uh, many expectations. Sure. Yeah. So it has to be from, let, let me say on the private side, private pockets, you know, multiple funds want to invest. Uh, that starts from early growth uh, investment funds to uh, more private equity, more um, then crossover investors into the larger uh, companies. And there, there, there's pockets everywhere. There are funds that are focused on, uh, let's say, growth and ESG. You know? and, and so there, there are themes here that, that are aligning where investors are digging and finding opportunities. Uh, but it, but it, I think it needs on the flip side, as we, as we said here a few times, stability of frameworks, reduction of risk, uh, relatively asset light uh, to begin with, and nimble, nimble adjustments over time. Uh, you know, these are the conditions to attract private capital. Marwa, uh, where did India find its money for electrifying buses? And can you let us know where that revenue stream is, please? Can I convert that to present tense? Where yes. is India looking for its money? <laughs> <laughs> OK, yes, absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs> let me put some numbers out here. Um, 115 million dollars uh, kept in, a, in an account on, as first loss, it doesn't have to be kept in cash, it can be uh, leveraged, gets us 10,000 electric buses on the road and gets those 10,000 electric buses financed. If a company that has all, if a few companies um, have come together and have already won capacities for 10,000 electric buses, they have been financed at their parent company level which means that they were unable to participate in further tenders. So going back to present tense, India now needs to do, well, it needs many more electric buses. 
but the target is 50,000 electric buses. Now, even if you say that there were not the next big tender that were to come out as another 5,000, 10,000 buses, it's going to be very difficult for these companies who are topped up uh, and maxed out on debt financing at the corporate level, and banks don't want to lend at the project level. So I go back to the 115. If I had $115 million, I could get three and a half billion dollars, that's how much it costs to do 10,000 electric buses, financed. And this has been tested. Now, where do we get the 115 million from? 40 can come from philanthropies. It should be able to come from philanthropies. There's a lot of philanthropy money that I hear in the new funds. They call, a, a, they call themselves catalytic capital. So going back to Patrick's point, you know, where will the money come from? Lots of different pockets. But really in this piece, the 115 million that I need to finance 10,000 electric buses, and that's exactly that's the only thing that's needed because the counterpart right now is too risky uh, to provide payment security to make these contracts bank bankable. Patrick, go ahead. If, if you mind, I ping back the ball and, and open another door uh, just regarding India or larger countries. Uh, have an additional complexity or opportunity. Uh, if we're talking about electrification, where are those value chain materials coming from is another big question and, and actually an opportunity. So uh, you know, charging stations not so difficult to manufacture, but batteries is a clear, clear focal point. Where the battery materials come from, where those are manufactured, you know, is an opportunity for larger countries uh, to, to reallocate and, and to domicile certain production, certain uh, material processing. Uh, even up to the mining point, if, if there are materials in the country, but, but certainly in the processing and, and, and assembly and manufacturing area, and to bundle that together with investments in, in the rollout or electrification, that can be a winning proposition, uh, potentially also you know, cheaper, more value added in, in the country. That's very, very important to think of and then, and then to find the financing for. Uh, three quick points, um, and I wanted to come back to Stinger's. Uh, when you said one uh, one bicycle can transport 26 persons, I thought you had been to some of our streets in Africa where it does transport five persons or three persons <laughs> plus a goat and some At chickens. At the same right? time. So, <laughs> yeah, so I was going through my head and said, wow, you're more efficient than, than we are. But um, oh, in, in, uh, in seriousness, I think the, the, the funding actually can come from three important sources that are lightly tapped right now. The first one are the micro investments by individuals. When you look at all of these active mobility solutions, uh, they come from individual uh, spending. And what needs to be done there, there is, is to offer then micro loans or micro uh, finance to those individuals. And with digital platforms now, you can do that quite efficiently. The second source, and this is true for most emerging and developing countries, is the pension funds. Because in those countries, in all the countries in Africa, for example, the pension funds uh, pockets are growing tremendously because population is growing. So the active contributors are growing. And therefore, that, those funds can be deployed uh, for this transition. And they are very lightly used right now because they like to invest in real estate, but not so much in climate uh, finance transitions. The last source which I find really uh, interesting is when you can combine uh, risk mitigation solutions as Maho was suggesting, with uh, hungry private capital that is looking for returns. The transport sector, when you look at everything that's layering on top of it, you can earn anywhere between 8 and 25% return, which means if you structure it right, you should have no trouble crowding in private investments because those returns are hard to find in other sectors. And that's something we haven't done enough of, particularly, and I was very excited to hear in the panel before us that there are now solutions of this uh, combined guarantee instrument that the multilateral development banks are putting together, that a number of other uh, investors from the um, uh, uh, shareholders of these MDBs are putting together. I think that collective uh, risk mitigation could do a lot to crowd in private capital in this area. But I still have the image of one bicycle with five persons on it, <laughs> because that's how we ride right now. <laughs> If you have questions for our plenary speakers, please, would you stand behind the microphone? 
uh, for the last time for TT23. Thank you so much. Victor, stand by because I'd love to know what was going on online and the questions that our online and virtual participants have. But I have not forgotten that question, Emmanuel, about rural access to climate finance. It was such a powerful question right at the beginning. Let's directly address that. Yeah, so um, uh, yeah. I was actually thinking quite a bit about it, right? Because yes. um, to me, it's choices that, um, uh, uh, particularly at the government level, right? Because uh, who has the obligation to provide us all with services and access, right? Typically, it's uh, government has a social obligation to do that, right? And then it has uh, choices, it has uh, constraints. Typically, I think we need to think uh, very carefully where the government wants to put its funding and where it wants to get additional uh, resources. And I think if we look at uh, the challenge of uh, bringing particularly these new innovative uh, green uh, transportation technologies, it's already a challenge in many of emerging markets to do it uh, within the urban centers where it's uh, more affordable, right? So I think governments are going to have to think and say, I can't fund everything. Where do I want to prioritize to get in those resources, right? And then I think a rural tends to be a, a, a piece where for affordability purposes, if you want to move uh, quickly and uh, provide more access, that to me, I think is where governments need to put their resources, right? Mm -hmm. To the extent we can, we should try and crowd in private, but I think that's a much more difficult, uh, I would say, say, a uh, part to uh, finance. One thing I wanted to also just uh, point out to that is the power of the government to, I would say, not just do policy, but also to do structuring transactions, right? So if you look at governments that have been able to do that, then they start to address what I think uh, you've mentioned, Franny, right? Open up uh, local local uh, financial markets, right? Open up what we can do with the um, uh, capital markets, uh, uh, stock exchanges, right? So government have incredible power in the, your own country, Mahoa. We've seen a kind of when it has done that, how it's been able to mobilize resources. So it's not just a question of um, FDI coming into the country and then coming into the urban centers, but can also then be pushed out into the rural sectors. Um, yeah. Wahua, well, I'm just wondering for India's electrification projects, are they just based in urban areas? What is happening in rural areas regarding uh, transportation, resilient transportation because of climate change? Are they still being left behind? Sure, so I'll, I'll put some examples here of what's going on uh, and what more needs to be done mm -hmm. in the short term. I'm going to leave the long term for a bit. Um, in my own experience in the last few years, we aggregated um, electric, I only worked on electric, electric two-wheelers. And we found, miraculously, that we could aggregate 100,000 quite easily. Um, and there was an, almost no need thereafter for the government to to engage itself because the market took off. And the way we did that is because we made these things available. These are all rural. These are government uh, employees who were doing work in rural areas, doing delivery and post-COVID kind of work in the health systems. And they needed locomotion. Um, and so we made these bikes available to them where it was cut off from their salaries. Their, their, pre their repayment was cut off from their salaries on the basis of seniority. And then I found miraculously that Citibank found that completely a bankable solution because people don't leave their government, people don't leave their jobs. So if they move around in the state, they continue to, to repay. And, and I felt at that point there was almost no need for any further intervention. That actually turned out to be very bankable. So where is India on electrification and the rural areas? As far as buses are concerned, that's, it's moving in. We still haven't completely stabilize the business model, the one particular business model that we have going, where I go back to the 17,000, out of that there's a large number, maybe about four or 5,000 buses that are servicing rural areas because they're doing what I call intercity, city to city, and these are small cities. Um, so that's, what, so far they've been tendered, contracted, the buses haven't come yet on the roads, they hit the roads in the next few months and they go on, and so we remains to be seen. Um, where are the rest of the rural areas? We, have, we actually have a supply problem in India right now. Mm. So, you know, if we were to tender another 10,000 electric buses only for the rural areas or the smaller cities, I'm not even sure where we are in supply. There are six electric bus or six companies that make electric buses and they're maxed out. I know they're maxed out. 
Um, and so before we even think of how to push, we just don't have enough supply, and we've made, domiciled it above 50%. So to wait for the next lot to come in and do the domiciling, we're going to lose a bit of time. So right now it's all eyes on getting these two-wheelers, getting these three-wheelers. Cars have not reached, look, have not reached through rural areas. We just don't have enough models on the road to even get into that discussion because they don't have the scale. And buses wait, wait and watch. I wanted to make a quick point on rural access, uh, which is interrelated with climate. Um, and this is uh, cable, transportation, and pedestrian bridges. When you look at the remote areas in most developing countries, they are best served with, served with those technologies. And they are climate friendly, they provide them tremendous and immediate access, and they're not expensive. Uh, so that's just something where the technology choice makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your patience. You ran to the microphone. What was so urgent? We can't wait to hear your question. No, because I didn't want to like miss the opportunity. Um, my name is Winnie Okello. I'm with Africa Engineering News. And I know, given the technical background, we, we've, we've done such a great job of talking about the technologies of things. But when we talk about climate mitigation and adaptation, um, we do show what we care about by what we fund. And so my, my direct question is, how will we ensure that we actually get the morality and ethics at the center of the, con of the conversation, especially when we're talking about emerging markets. How are we going to ensure that morality and ethics and the human set centeredness of decision making is prioritized and how these fundings are actually implemented? Thank you. That silence says so much. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Five people sighing. <laughs> Who's going to be very... Uh, Ah, Patrick. <laughs> well, I think that that speaks to the G and the ES, ESG, right? Uh, that that is really the job of the governance angle uh, of of the stakeholders, not just uh, investors, but the stakeholders to to make sure that it takes the, the mark. And there are benchmarks there, there are frameworks, uh, uh, lots. But I think it's you know it is there uh, as an uh, aspiration, and it should be implemented. Is your next career going to be politics? <laughs> Stinger. Well, I just came from politics, so... Um, uh, but I actually think, um, maybe on an optimistic note, uh, the facts are also starting to speak uh, in this direction. Um, if you see that act actually, towards the future, clean options, if you look at a life cycle assessment, are actually the cheaper options. And then if I were talking again about active mobility, it's a lot cheaper, right? So the facts are actually also pushing us to consider those options as realistic options amongst all of the other options um, uh, and to give priority to them because they're cleaner, it's better for air quality, it's more equitable. Um, uh, and these are the kind of solutions that we are actually, actually all looking for. So we should just push ourselves to look beyond what we're traditionally looking at. Um, and then I think the facts are also starting to speak uh, for ourselves. I think, uh, Moua, you also had some, some great examples for that. I just want, let me just add, add some examples to what uh, Stinger was saying. Uh, we've proven that electric mobility is cheaper than, uh, than diesel or petrol. Um, in India, a in relatively large market, Solar power is cheaper than new coal. Solar power is cheaper than existing coal. And wind and solar combined are still cheaper than new coal or existing coal. Now add a battery to it. And battery plus solar is cheaper than power that's made available at 6 p.m. Because 6 p.m. when the sun goes down, I should be able to juice up a battery. Now assume for a minute we're, we're in this transport panel. In a few years from now, we will be offloading batteries from the buses we've put on the road. And we'll be offloading batteries from all, all of the other, other vehicles, two-wheelers and three-wheelers. Now those batteries have not actually lost their life. Uh, they've certainly not, they're, they're fit for, they've lost their transportation life with a little bit of rework and there are markets for that. They can assume for a minute they come in at half the price. So now, a few years from now, battery plus solar plus wind will still be cheaper than brown power that comes in, in the evening. So I think while standards and, 
and ESG standards and things like that are, are fantastically useful for, uh, for ethics and things like that. But I think the conversion to green now is purely simply an economic decision. And again, just again, from where I sit, from where I live right now, India is going through an energy transition problem. And I hate to, I keep putting in the India problem because I'm live sitting there right now. In energy transition situation, the addition of renew, so much renewables on the grid is it has itself become a limiting factor for the grid to absorb more renewables. So we, there's a different problem in different places. If it's cheaper, I think the morality part gets taken care of. Maybe just two aspects of um, the questions of uh, ethics and uh, morality. So um, a lot of uh, procurement is done by the public sector even when you're bringing in the private sector. So in our business is uh, basically to make sure that uh, whatever standard is standard in a transparent way, that the government has the capacity as it develops and as it negotiates uh, transactions. So this is uh, uh, partly uh, one of the things that uh, we do within my group in the IFC, right? That we are an advisor to the government and give them uh, that capacity as they design projects, as they tender projects, as they negotiate uh, projects, that those projects are uh, also um, subject to a competitive process and that they are the most affordable they could be. I think the other element uh, to me of uh, morality is that uh, we are inclusive in the projects that we design, particularly across uh, the bank group, right? That they consider the poor and affordability, that they consider particularly aspects of uh, this, this advantage and the disincluded, uh, the aspects of gender, the aspects of uh, those uh, with disabilities when we are designing uh, projects that uh, are going to last for 20 years or so. So we don't only look at the technology pieces, but at the pieces of how that kind of uh, technology is going to be used. So those would be, uh, I would say, two additional very pragmatic uh, considerations as uh, we design projects. We do quite a lot of uh, intellectual uh, property um, uh, development in the bank group to assist uh, the public sector for doing this. So just a small plug for something that uh, we've uh, just uh, released, I think, uh, yesterday in the transport space, an e-bus um, uh, e uh, toolkit that actually is meant to support the private sector, uh, the, the public sector in designing these projects. How do you design them in an inclusive way and address uh, some of those, um, I would say, inequities where we're trying to get uh, more for more people? Mm -hmm. um, I would say uh, if you start with people and planet and then build up from there, morality and ethics are a given. And I, I took, take the example of transport. If you start from the people side, it's affordable access, which is the key issue. And then the question is how can affordable access be provided in a way that is not detrimental or actually works with nature? And that's where all of these solutions then come up. So you take simple examples. Poor people in cities live very far from work. So depending on what solution you offer, they may not be able to go to work in ba uh, 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 back and forth, for example, on a bicycle, because they have to carry freight on it. So you have to think about that. So that takes you to the next level, maybe electrical mobility or some other solution of rapid transport like BRT. So as you layer these choices, I think it becomes quite natural, the morality and ethics fall into place. But I think you have to start with people and planet. Then technology, financing arrangements, all this becomes secondary. But th that, that morality is at that base of people and planet. Mm -hmm. We have a virtual audience with us this afternoon. Victor is the chat moderator. Victor, what is going on online? Can you summarize it and uh, share the best questions as well, please? Thank you, Femi. We have a couple questions from our online audience. Okay. First off, what is climate finance? If there is an investment in a railway, is that project finance or green finance? How does climate finance relate to green funds? And why are most people equating climate finance with electric mobility? And second question. That, that was one question? That was one question. That was not one question. <laughs> Virtual? I need to have a word with you. That was not one question. Let's, let, did you want to recap the first question? Because there were multiple parts to it. What is climate finance? Yep. How does it is differentiated from project finance? And how does climate finance relate to green funds? And second question, how can small countries with small transport projects improve their pitch to access climate finance? OK. These are questions that we could have started out with. Victor, thank you. Um, we're going to do this really quickly. 
Fanny, climate finance and the difference between climate finance and project finance in a sentence. Uh, climate finance is uh, financial resources that are brought to deal with climate risks and they can be projectized but they can also be portfolio level or asset level but then the nature of the finance is really to deal with climate risks so and it's different from green finance because green finance focuses on only one dimension of climate finance which is the re removing of the carbon from from the solutions so. and emmanuel can you deal with the second one about small countries uh, yeah, I think it's uh, the point I made that they need to address the whole element of uh, how do you bring financing mainly through uh, policy and uh, uh, through projects in a very simple yeah. way. Victor, this is really important. Anything else that came through from our online audience that kind of takes us back to basics, which is really important? Indeed, but I'm afraid there is nothing more. All right. Thank you. Thank Virtual, you. you still have time. You've got another 10 more minutes before we wrap it up. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, uh, this is Ran Zhe, uh, coming from EDF China. Uh, my question is quite simple. Uh, is it easier, uh, in nowadays, is it easier or more difficult to make investment? Uh, if the answer is more difficult because you have so many factors uh, to consider, how can we say that we are accelerating uh, to achieve our uh, climate goals? Thanks. Hmm. Who wants to answer that one? Yeah, please. I, I don't know if it's more difficult these days. Maybe conversations sound like that because we're attempting to get financed assets and asset classes that were not otherwise financed. We don't have these conversations in pan on panels on real estate uh, or anywhere else. We have these conversations around risk and difficulties because we're trying to address very difficult things like new technologies in difficult markets, untested market failure situations. So the conversation sounds a bit difficult because we're trying to correct for so many things in one shot and scale at the same time. Um, I would say in some ways it's easier and in some ways it's more difficult. Where is it easier? For most emerging economies and developing countries where there is no infrastructure, then it's very easy to combine transport and climate. Where it's hard is for those areas where you have invested already in old technologies because it's really expensive to break up and reconstruct. And there, all these considerations around resettlement, around uh, climate-friendly construction techniques, and so on become very pressing, and all the ESG issues take a lot of time to resolve. And that's where it gets very hard. Or if you're doing open ac opening access to rural areas and you're going through natural ecosystems that shouldn't be disturbed or it's difficult to get them back to their their performance after construction of those infrastructures that takes time because you have to negotiate multiple things not just with the local community and indigenous people but also with the global community that wants to preserve say forest assets for carbon sequestration or natural ecosystems it becomes a very complex conversation on a global scale so that there it gets hard and it gets long it took us 10 years to do the Mumbai Urban Transport Project when I was at the World Bank because you had to think of so many things before you could put that very efficient pub transport solution. It took us 15 years before we could do the Jamuna Bridge in Bangladesh, right? So similar uh, challenges because there's so many complex people, planet interfaces, which takes time. Franny, do you know at the beginning when you start a project that it's going to take 15 years? Not at all. In the case of Bangladesh, for example, we thought it could be easily solved because it was, was laughing. It was such a, <laughs> such a great project. Everybody loved it. But yeah. then it became very complex because you have a migrating river. You have people who are living on islands when the river migrates to find homes and jobs for them. Uh, and it's very difficult because you can't displace people when you are doing those large infrastructures without offering opportunities. So the, the difficulty 
quality came during implementation, not at the design stage, which I found very interesting. If we were to do it today, we would have had already the planet considerations in mind and would have designed it completely differently. Mm. But back in the 1990s, those were second, third questions that you'd ask. Today, they are the first or second question that you ask. Patrick, you picked up your microphone. Yeah, I wanted to clearly state that it has become easier in, in my perspective uh, to finance, and hopefully that is uh, perceived as such. But we're going through cycles all the time, economic cycles and all sorts of cycles where funding is short. Now, in all of that noise, if there's a secular change like climate change, you know, that attracts more money than all the small noise and should definitely have become easier as a theme to support than, than others. Can you remember a moment during the climate crisis where investing or investments and financing became easier? Was it a sort of aha light bulb moment or a year or a couple of years where you, you saw that change? I mean, one, one is the topic of electrification, which yeah. 10 years ago wasn't used in finance, maybe not even five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is the you know, post-COVID normalization of, of mobility, back to normal, but let's use that chance to redirect some funds into a more sustainable transport infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's really interesting to note that only 3% of climate finance goes to Africa. At the same time, we have a recent publication from the bank that says um, the maintenance costs for transport infrastructure in Africa is going to triple over the next 10 years. So there's clearly a huge gap, and that seems to be getting wider. So the question is, is it because we don't have the evidence base? We don't know what works? What is it? Or is it better knowledge management? So my direct question is to each of the panelists is, if you had, say, a million dollar each to invest on improving that, what specific research subject would you put it into? Just a million. Just a million. <laughs> Stinger. Well, I would invest it in, um, in active mobility because the maintenance costs are a lot lower, so it's easier to, uh, um, it's easier to, to factor that in. Um, and also because I feel it's um, maybe the more underutilized uh, solution in urban setting. So I think there's a, a lot of low-hanging fruit to be picked there, so that's why I would start there. Patrick? Sorry, if I can just clarify, it has to be to do with access to better access to finance. It has to be about access to finance because we know we can invest in other areas of decarbonisation and so on. Yeah. And because my own experience was that financing, especially these form of infrastructure, is much more complicated um, because it's not as readily on people's mind as one of the modes of transport in a total set of modes of transport that you could look to for solutions in your overall transport strategy. Um, if I look at the national, national budgets of the Netherlands that we spend, um, they, were, they were going to rail, uh, national railway, and they were going to national roads. Uh, so already regional uh, tramways were not really in the national budget, uh, let alone cycling uh, uh, or walking. These were considered to be municipal uh, policies. But if you look at the overall congestion in a certain region of the Netherlands, which was so big, could actually only be solved by taking some people off the road. Uh, in the end, we did find on the national level uh, the funds to invest in cycling highways um, to get some people off the road that didn't necessarily really need to be there. So looking at these kind of, of solutions as part of your overall solutions is something which is, I think, underutilized. It's not that active mobility is a silver bullet for everything. It's not like it, like any of the other modes of transport is not either, but it's one of those areas that is, I think, could be optimized as one ingredient in an overall optimized transport strategy. All right, I'm gonna speed this up because I have another session to do now. <laughs> no pressure, Patrick, go ahead. You mean one sentence answer. <laughs> <laughs> you read my mind. Um, Brilliant. 
Yeah, so if it's where to put the money to, to um, uh, answer the question, mobility in Africa, it, it really is to substantiate the business models that are right locally because it's not one size fits all for Africa. Mobility will be very, very different uh, depending on the locality. Mm -hmm. Manuel. So I'll still spend my uh, million dollars on uh, getting the government's capacity to open up spaces. I spent 16 years with the government, 10 of them uh, heading a, a program in the transport sector. I've spent 16 years advising governments, and I feel they are the key to opening up spaces, particularly for the private sector to leverage. Um, I would put the million dollars to support countries to know what to ask from all of these climate funds that are out there that are not going now to the poorer countries because they don't have the capability to put together a good proposition. So that's where I would put it. If the million dollars was my own money, <laughs> <laughs> I worked, I've worked now in about 10 or 15 countries across the world. And if it was my own money, I would put it, of course, I'm only talking about green and clean. Yeah, I'm, I'm going back to the people and planet. I, I love that way of looking at it. Um, I'd put it into anything that is digitized and reaches a person such so that the value, so that whatever I'm offering you is cheaper. If my green option is cheaper, if it is more efficient, if it's electric and it's just cheaper, I want to put my million bucks into any sort of intervention that I can reach you digitally as to an individual. And I offer you a service or a product that is cheaper. Thank you. Panel, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Stinger, Patrick, Emmanuel, Franny, Maha.